Thank you. I mean, th th this has been a, a topic of debate probably for a century at least, how to get civilian uses of military technologies. Uh, what has the world learnt about how to do this well? Dr. Prater, perhaps you could start. Thank you for, for the question. I, I would say that uh, this is not a, a big issue in Brazil. It's not a, 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 big, uh, a big problem. Uh, most of our research in Brazil, uh, I would say that uh, is performed at uh, university and, uh, and uh, research institutions that are, are, very, are very open. And uh, most of the effort that uh, we do related to defense uh, is, is, is already used in, in other sectors of uh, our 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 economy in general one one thing that uh, is is crucial in brazil well maybe more than one thing but uh, we are talking about uh, investment and research and development in brazil this number is 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 is, uh, is small is uh, around 1.3 percent of our gdp we invest in uh, research and development and uh, worse than that is uh, Almost 60% of this investment is, is done by the public sector. So we have to, to, to push our private sector to invest in research and development. And uh, small and uh, medium enterprise is a big thing in Brazil, as in, in many other countries. And we have a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, uh, but most of them are not uh, technological oriented. So going back to, to, to your question, our, our biggest challenge is uh, how uh, to bring the, the available research and the, the scientific knowledge in general to the society and uh, how to how to, to bring the, the advance and uh, related to many fields, sustainability, sanitation, uh, energy, to, to the society in general. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Damage. Sure. Um, the OECD obviously doesn't do a lot of work on, on defense-related issues. That's, that's not what we're set up for. But I can, I can give you, if, if it's helpful, a specific example of, of how the United States works some of this, because um, obviously I, I spent a lot of my career working for the U.S. government. We have uh, in the United States something called the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. And DARPA does a lot of cutting edge work that's applied to, to the military, to military technology and military needs. But some of that research obviously works its way into, into the civilian sector as well. And I'll give you a very specific example. Do you remember in 2000, um, during the presidential campaign, Al Gore was quoted as saying uh, that he discovered the internet, that he was one of the founders of the internet. Well, I think what he really meant was that he'd been a big supporter of DARPA, and some of DARPA's original research helped found or helped help sort of lay the basis, the foundation for what is now the internet. And obviously that's, that's, that was used, DARPA's a military agency, and that was used for the military, but it obviously it has much broader civilian uh, civilian applications and economic applications. So a lot of the military technology finds its way for civilian uses. I don't know if you watched any of the news this morning seeing some of the horrible, horrible devastation in the Philippines. And we got to see it a little more closely because of drones. And those drones were able to sort of go in areas where people couldn't go and really give us a bird's eye view of what was going on. Now, obviously, drones have military application as well. So there's crossover. Um, the, 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 so, some technology can't be used, some technology is classified, but, but over time it can be declassified and used, and those are two examples uh, uh, of the kind of military application that could eventually be used for civilian purposes, and I, I hope that, that's helpful. In our own lives and our own organizations often learn as much from failures, or indeed from observing things other people didn't get right, and that helps us to do things better. So I, w I wonder if I could ask each of you to share one example of how in your own work of innovation you have either learnt from a failure of your own or from seeing something else which appeared 
successful elsewhere but didn't quite work and that has helped you to do your work better. Is that okay if we could have just a, a brief comment from each of you and perhaps start with you, Dr. Mayer. Yes, well, uh, very often I see that in, um, in Italy uh, we have uh, basically all the ingredients, going back to the cooking metaphor that you used uh, earlier, because we have, and the, the, the problem really has to do with mixing them. And uh, especially the situation I had some, you know, uh, as I said, we are quite successful. Uh, this ours is uh, supposed to be the, the rich part of, of Italy. Still, we have these, uh, say, uh, informal settlements of the Roma people. Well, there, uh, the, we, we had a situation where many of the, of the children were not vaccinated. And uh, when I was elected mayor five years ago, and uh, I, I said, well, why doesn't it work? We have such a mm, sort of a, a health system there. We have workers. I mean, why don't they deliver? Uh, so uh, the, the, what I, I realized was that uh, uh, we had voluntary organizations that helped them. We had, uh, uh, of course, our social workers from the municipality. But these people were not really talking to each other. We're not really doing uh, an, an integrated uh, uh, action. And so just by actually getting all the potential ingredients around the table and uh, making them all feel uh, this uh, double, uh, what I call double affiliation, they're not just performing for one particular organization, they are performing for more than one. Uh, in some sense, some, somehow made me achieve the 100% the, the vaccination also in the, in the, in, for children in the informal, informal settlements. So this is, I think, what I, what I learned. It was failing essentially because we had everything, we were pushing, but the people didn't talk to each other. Mr. Danvers. Um, in the financial services industry, there was a great deal of deregulation. Again, I'm going to have to use the United States as an example because that's what I'm most for, familiar with um, in, in the 80s and the 90s. And, and there are those who believe, and I don't necessarily agree with them 100 percent, but those who believe that this deregulation came too quickly and this kind of innovation to just sort of let, a, let, let, let the financial markets sort of work their will and not worry about regulation help bring about what, the, what became the sort of the mortgage banking crisis. Um, in the United States. And that's an example of maybe going too fast. I, I mentioned overregulation, um, but that's maybe an example of going a little bit too fast and not being careful enough about how we deregulate. Um, again, that's that there have been books and books and books written about this, and I don't, I don't, uh, I don't claim to be, to be an expert by any means, but, but I think it is an example of, of doing too much too fast and not sort of looking around the corner about the consequences of, of, of some of what we do in the name of, 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 of progress. Certainly in Europe and North America, financial innovation destroyed quite phenomenal amounts of value, which is a reminder that anyone involved in innovation needs to be careful they are backing good innovations, not bad innovations. And, and that's all, always, always better oh, yeah. to see after it's all over. You know, yeah. Hindsight is always the easiest yeah. way to ju make judgments on that. Yeah. So not so much a failure, but more a lesson learned, and I uh, refer back to what I spoke about, uh, recycling. Uh, and as I said, most people uh, believe that the cotton is, you know, has very good paper, uh, very good fiber. Um, so the cottons usually land up in uh, paper waste, but even the recyclers uh, typically are paper mills who recover the paper. And uh, I just I'm very lucky and it's very convenient that I have a couple of props in my pocket. So this is a business card which is made out of paper recovered from our cartons and this is a pen that's made out of the polyethylene and the aluminum. And really the lesson learned for us around the world, which we, uh, I think we borrowed, inspired by what happened in Brazil many years ago, is that it is the polyethylene and the aluminum that can really get the true value for the recycler, not so much the paper. So the paper can allow you just, just about to survive. You cannot make money, but it's really the poly -L. If you can start making the money from here, then it is really, uh, you know, then you, you are set to make, uh, create a sustainable solution. So it's a little bit about marketing myopia as well. Determining 
or defining what business are you in? Are you in the paper recycling business or are you in the recycling business? Thank you. Thank you. Well, my job mainly involves tracking what's happening in India to report back to Switzerland. So I really don't have very concrete examples of uh, failure, so to say, in Switzerland, but uh, uh, some lacuna that we have uh, discovered. I mean, I started working for the Swiss Embassy a year ago, and we are pretty bad at following where Swiss graduates have gone. We tried to find, track those who, the Indian students had gone to Switzerland and came back, and Swiss, many universities didn't have these lists. So I don't know if that's a failure, but uh, I think that's a lost, uh, that's lost potential and also what happens with Swiss, uh, Swiss startups coming out of universities. Uh, very often we don't, the successful ones we know about, but those that didn't succeed, uh, there's been no attempts at tracking what happened, uh, why they didn't succeed. So now, I mean, speaking to people again, there's been attempts being made to try and find what, where these companies are, if they're no longer there or why, and uh, hopefully we learn some lessons from that as well. I think that uh, probably one of of our failures was uh, neglecting education. And uh, we are trying to catch up on that. For a long time, uh, we neglected education. And now, more and more, we are convinced that uh, the solution for all difficulties that uh, we face now is educating people, educating in a very broad sense. We are talking about innovation here. Educated people are natural innovative people because they perceive the world as it is. Uh, they have a respect for our civilization, for nature in general and they can find uh, new paths for improving the world, and improving society in general. So it educate people in a very broad sense. And uh, in Brazil, we have to stress education uh, uh, with a particular uh, emphasis on science and, uh, and uh, appreciation for, for technology. So, I hope that uh, more and more we'll be able to improve our numbers related to to, to education. And a second uh, uh, thing that I'd like to stress is manufacturing. And uh, more and more the countries, they go back to manufacturing, like uh, knowing how to make things. And uh, we have some good examples. Uh, uh, like uh, United Kingdom, for instance, neglected uh, manufacturing for some time, and now more and more is uh, catching up again in manufacturing, even the United States. So, uh, uh, we are, again, we are talking about uh, innovation. If you know how to make things, then uh, you can uh, spread this philosophy of making things uh, in, in building a successful country. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to all our speakers for being so uh, clear and uh, concise. I, I just want to make one, one final um, comment. Um, we've been talking here today about global best practice, sharing ideas, and so on. And I think there's a, there's a paradox which I know a number of people around this table have, have been trying to address. On the one hand, thanks to Google, it feels as if you can get hold of any example of practice around the world much more easily than in any past era. And yet the structuring of that knowledge is extremely primitive. It's very hard to find out what in fact are all the promising innovations in any field, from education to agriculture to healthcare, and even harder to find any definitive judgment about the evidence base of which of them work and which don't. And in field after field, we see the ideas which spread are not necessarily the best ideas. They may be the ones which are most enthusiastically promoted. 
Uh, and this is, I think, quite a, a, a challenge for the innovation community. How do we, in a sense, get our, our, our systems of orchestration of knowledge um, uh, appropriate for an interconnected world and not just rely on the, the randomness of search engine rankings? Perhaps that is something we might talk a little bit about over lunch, which we are now ready for, I hope, uh, and we'll be outside. And the next session, Sam, begins at uh, one o'clock. Yeah. Uh, I have just quick yeah. announcements. If you have still not given your passport details, please do so. It is important if you want to attend, function at the president's home. Two, in the afternoon, there will not have time for tea break. So get ready for it. <laughs> and three, we must try to wind up by 4, 4.15 because unfortunately they want us to be seated at the president's house way before 5.30. So 5.30 is the time for the function to start. The seating and security and entry could be pretty messy at times. So get ready to have enough time. Okay. Since the function is at 5.30, don't show up at 5.25. It doesn't work that way at president's home, unfortunately. Okay. So, Thank you, and, and, and let's... And no please. phones or cameras, I'm told. Yes. Oh, but they will take it and store it for you, and when you get out, okay. they'll give it to you, so no problem. Okay. okay. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, everyone. Good session, huh? Good session. Thanks.